Hi everybody, I'm very excited to introduce uh, Daphne Kohler who did an interview with Simply Statistics yesterday when she was here visiting. She's a professor of computer science at Stanford University and one of the co-founders of Coursera, which in just under two years has revolutionized the way we think about higher education. Just faculty here in biostatistics at Johns Hopkins have taught over a half a million people about statistics on her platform. We talked with her a little bit about the future of higher education, about MOOCs, about Coursera, and about how faculty might get involved with the uh, platform that she's developed. We're very excited about the interview and hope you enjoy it. All right, so I guess the first question that we wanted to ask you about, um, so we're obviously very excited about Coursera. We both teach classes for you um, on that platform, and we wondered we a little- teach classes for the students. That's right. We just help you do we're that. We're not doing it, yes. Okay, yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, step one, already, already fumbling. Okay, so, <laughs> No, the question is that we, we were kind of interested in it was about the Coursera origin story. So we kind of know a little bit about how it happened, but if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, how that happened, how you decided to, mm -hmm. to do Coursera and pursue it. Wow. So I, um, I actually got into this in my role as a Stanford faculty member about five years ago from the perspective of trying to improve the quality of education yeah. for Stanford students by, from the realization that you know, the lecture just was not a really good way to teach people. Uh -huh. um, and it wasn't a very engaging um, place for the students to spend time. It was a really engaging way for the faculty to spend time. And I actually came to that realization when listening to a talk about YouTube and realizing that, you know, why does it make sense for me to come and deliver the same lecture year after year after year where I could package it in much smaller bite-sized chunks that were much more fun and much more um, cohesive and then use the class time for engaging with students in more meaningful ways. And so for me, that was the beginning of a path that led to the development of a lot of the ideas that are currently part of the Coursera student experience. Um, and that created a fair bit of excitement at Stanford, as did the efforts of, um, of others, including my colleague, Andrew Wang, who had been working on a related but different trajectory. And it was that energy that led in the fall of 2011 to the launch of the three large Stanford classes, which I guess are the first of this right. new generation of MOOCs. Um, and each of those classes had an enrollment of 100,000 students or more in a matter of weeks. And that, for us, was a real moment in history because we realized that we suddenly had the opportunity to take an experience that had been available up until that point only to a tiny handful of very privileged Stanford students and make it available to anyone around the world with an internet connection at what is effectively zero marginal cost per student. And that was an opportunity that one couldn't really pass up um, because the impact of it on the world, the potential impact is just too great. And so that's when we decided that uh, we needed to make of it something that was bigger and even more impactful by working not just within Stanford but across multiple top universities to offer some great courses like yours <laughs> um, to everyone around the world. So was there, uh, did you have any, uh, you know, you've been, you said you've been doing this for several years before the 2000, you know, the first we heard about it obviously was the big splash of the, of the three really right. big classes. Um, did you have any uh, inkling in the back of your mind that that was going to happen when you started running? I mean, was there, I know when we started, we had no idea no, how many people yeah. were going to write. We were totally unprepared mm -hmm. for the volume. Yeah. And were you? did you kind of see that coming? When you no. Were, okay. I think this was <laughs> a big surprise to all of us. I think one of the most interesting realizations to come out of this effort is the amazing hunger that exists uh, in people everywhere for high quality education. And those are um, both people where you might expect there to be that hunger, like in the developing world where the opportunities for education are very, very limited. And at this point, 40% of our students are in the developing world, which is a pretty, which is an amazingly high fraction. But the other place where I think that hunger has revealed itself and in a surprising way is in the continuing education, a lifelong learner market, where there's so many people who are actually educated, who have degrees or working professionals. And I don't think anyone realized just how many of them were interested in just continuing to learn throughout their lifetime and were not and where the existing opportunities were just not sufficient for them. Right. That was something we noticed too. I think that the fraction of people who are enrolled at universities is maybe not as big as, you know, continuing ed and people from other countries and yeah. so that that's borne out in across 
all the Coursera yeah. sort of classes as well? The people who are enrolled in academic institutions are a relatively tiny fraction of, right. the, of the students who are taking the Coursera classes. Um, I don't remember the exact numbers, they vary from, from course to course, but the vast majority are continuing education, people in their 30s and 40s. Right. Um, there's some high school students looking to prepare for college, or there is some, but not a huge number of, of currently enrolled college students. One of the things we wanted to, we're interested in a lot is kind of like you know, being faculty at a university. So uh, it's kind of like you know, how, how the, what the career kind of looks like. And uh, if, we, if you don't mind putting your other hat on as a professor <laughs> at Stanford, just for a moment. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I feel like even since I started out, which is about eight, eight or nine years ago, um, you know, Jeff's an assistant professor. Uh, it's actually very different now than it was even. And you know, for me, when I started, it was you know, write papers, teach a class. Uh, you know, do some service and just do that really well. Mm -hmm. Now it's like you still have to do all that, mm -hmm. but there's the toolbox is quite a bit bigger in terms of, and, and also I think one of the things that unifies a lot of it is the kind of direct engagement with the public, mm -hmm. uh, either with blogging, social media, and now I think with, with the MOOCs, it's you know you're teaching not just the people sitting here in your building, but it's anyone, mm -hmm. yeah. and and that has you know raised our profile, uh, you know. And, in ways that are maybe good or bad, who knows? <laughs> but uh, it, you know, it's different. Yeah. Uh, in terms of, so I think as you know, if you're a new assistant professor coming into the whatever career, whatever field, you know, there's a lot of tools in the toolbox and um, and a lot of things that you could do. And I don't know if you have any thoughts about what you know what might be a, uh, like a path, career path for someone like that. Well, I mean, I think that the um, I don't think it's at the point where this kind of public facing involvement is mandatory in the sense that you can't succeed in your career without having that. I mean, I know a lot of people who are very successful who don't blog um, and who don't teach in MOOC, and I expect that will continue at least for a good while. Um, but I think what this has done is it has opened the opportunity for other career paths, other ways of making an impact that are not so much the traditional ways. Um, and I think that's something that is really important for institutions to encourage. Uh, sometimes I have these discussions with um, some people at academic institutions who say that they feel that um, by engaging, for example, with MOOCs or blogs or social media, they are diverting um, energy from what is their primary function, which is teaching of their registered students. And certainly there are some institutions for which that is the key function, but I think for most academic institutions, if I had to say what the primary function of an academic institution is, it's the creation and dissemination of knowledge. And certainly doing that to your own registered students is a big part of that, but I think as we see from uh, what institutions have always done, it's not just that. I mean, when we write papers, it's not primarily for the benefit of our registered undergraduate students or even our registered PhD students. It's, it's because part of our function is to create and disseminate knowledge as broadly as possible. And this is a different vehicle, one would argue in many ways a much broader reach vehicle than most others that we've developed. And I think it's incumbent upon us to make use of that so that we can bring knowledge to a much larger number of people because the only way society is going to move forward is if more people are better educated. Yeah, I guess a question, a related question is, so suppose you are advising a person who's sort of mm -hmm. a junior faculty member like me or somebody else like me who is thinking about doing MOOCs. You know, our, our I think, institution has been very supportive mm -hmm. of this idea, especially given the uh, incredible uncertainty that's been, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, caused by this mm -hmm. whole development. But do you think that this is something that a junior faculty member should should take on? Is it something that they should, you know, be careful with? Is it, you know, I'm just curious what you think about that. I know that's kind of a loaded question, so feel free to <laughs> deflect if you prefer. <laughs> so. First of all, you know, I don't think should is the right um, verb to use here because yeah. I think it really depends on the faculty member's own inclinations. Mm -hmm. Do they want to do this? is teaching to a broad audience something that they're good at. I don't think you should go to a faculty member who feels uncomfortable connecting with a really wide audience and, and saying, oh, you have to do this because it's important to your career. So, but I think it's something that if, even as a junior faculty member, if you feel like this is what you want to do and you have a message that you want to convey to a large number of people, um, I think it's something an institution should encourage and also 
reward in the sense that uh, when I evaluate tender cases, what I look for is not the number of papers or the you know e even the venues where they were published, but rather the impact um, a, of a you know a person's scholarly works. And I think that teaching is a scholarly work as well. The kind of distillation of knowledge that has to occur in order to put together a really great course is, is a scholarly endeavor. And we should reward people who do that well because they are contributing to the mission of the institution. Um, but it should be something that the individual professor wants to do. Right, that makes, that, that's a good answer. <laughs> Much better than I would have come up with. <laughs> Um, I think, uh, I don't know, do you have any more questions? Well, I guess one of the things that we've thought about here a lot is how you know, teaching, you know, is for, for the most part this very localized activity mm -hmm. and essentially overnight oh, it yeah. became an international activity. Yeah. So, I mean, you now it's like the world can know about your teaching rather than even our largest classes have a couple hundred people. Yep. You know? And I just wonder if you had any thoughts about that. I mean, as like the role of teaching, if you're going to, if you decide to engage in MOOCs, you can very easily have an international reputation uh, yeah. you know, with respect to your teaching alone, or forget about your research. And, uh, and I just wonder if you have any thoughts on that. I actually think it's one of the coolest consequences of this <laughs> effort, is the teaching and quality of teaching that used to be something that you could hide away from everyone because who of your colleagues is going to come and attend your class and I mean, are people really going to go and look at your teaching evaluations except maybe your department chair and dean at promotion time. Here, we're suddenly in a world where teaching is really visible to everyone and as a consequence, good teaching is going to be visible as a role model and bad teaching is something that people are going to look at and say, well, you know, maybe you should have worked on this a little bit harder. And I think as a consequence of that, the quality of teaching is going to increase steadily and iteratively over the course of the coming years because people are going to be embarrassed if their teaching is not as good. They're also going to be able to, to look at and learn from and emulate good teaching habits that they see in some of those courses. And furthermore, because of the very tight and immediate feedback loop that you get by teaching in this online context where people are constantly providing you sometimes more than you would like yes. <laughs> uh, the kind of criticism of what on earth were you talking about in that video I had no idea what you were saying um, on the one hand and on the other hand the kind of data analytics that we get where you realize that's a topic that you had you thought you had explained really well nobody got that set of questions so maybe you didn't do such a good job of explaining it you get to learn from those analytics also to improve your teaching all the time. So I think what we're going to see is in the same way that human performance has been improving steadily in other arenas, be it you know in, in research on the one hand or you know in sports on the other. Why is sport improving all the time? It's because people look at what others are doing and learning from it. I think we're now going to see that same evolution happening in teaching, and that's going to be really awesome in terms of student outcomes. I think Jeff wants to know how many hours you sleep at night. <laughs> yeah, I, I do kind of have. I was gonna say, what's the work-life balance of somebody who's running this whole operation? But I mean, uh, you're a professor and then co-founder of Coursera, and obviously you're traveling a lot, and we want to know how you, uh, you know. <laughs> is it, does this seem? Has this been just an insane couple of years for you, or it's the... been insane? <laughs> it's also been somewhat surreal in that this is not a lifestyle that I ever imagined, right. aspired to. <laughs> um, it's, you know, sometimes I look at my life and I'm saying, really? I mean, whose life is this? <laughs> um, I feel a little bit like, you know, the main character from the movie being John Malkovich, where <laughs> you find yourself in somebody else's life and, you, you know, you look around you and you say, it's not my life, but it's kind of cool, so I'm going to go with it, so that's right. kind of how it feels. Okay. <laughs> Just roll with it. Yeah. <laughs> but it's fun, it's exciting, because I think with all of the work, and it's been a lot of work, um, and certainly, you know, I can't say that my family is entirely thrilled <laughs> with uh, the amount of time that I spend working or on the road, um, to put it mildly, <laughs> but, um, but I think the 
palpable and enormous impact that this is having on the lives of so many people. It makes it all worthwhile. And the amazing thing about education is that it really not only transforms the life of individual people as they all of a sudden have doors of opportunity open to them that they that they didn't have before, but by picking up someone from their life and sort of lifting them up by educating them, you're actually also picking up everyone around them, their families, their communities, you're kind of like there's a ripple effect that, that emanates from that one intervention that I think could have profound implications on society as we have more and more of that going on. I think that's one of the exciting opportunities that we have here. Well, we're very excited to see how things turn. I mean, obviously, yeah. this is a very cool time to be involved in all of it. And thanks a lot for taking the time to talk to us. We know you're super busy, so well, no, thanks thank a lot. You. Thank you. Thank uh, you for teaching some amazing classes. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> no problem. <laughs>